understand that. You read John 9 where Jesus explained it. He said to her, give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom. You can, mothers can understand that, holding a baby through his sickness who has died in her arms. And carried him up to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. And he called to the Lord and he said, O Lord my God, hast thou brought also brought calamity also, also beyond the drought? You remember the drought has affected the Phoenicians as well as the Israelites. O Lord my God, hast thou brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? It's the drought, isn't it enough? I mean, how much hardship must we bear? And now we have a dead child. You recall when he met her? She was picking up sticks to eat her last meal and to die with a child. That wasn't reality in her heart, was it? You know, that's facts, not fear. <laughs> Let me tell you, facts are fear, and the proof of it is in my church. Because we don't walk by faith, we walk by fear. There's a world of difference between these two things. Thank you, Al. How to do it? Well, anyhow, back to Elijah. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. You know, people ask, why would he lay on the child three times and have three prayers such as this? Let me tell you, if you've ever been a parent and you set with a sick child, I mean a really sick child, and your heart says to the Lord, Father, if there's any way you could transfer that to me, rather than this child, that would be okay. I mean, has that thought not crossed, crossed your mind? I'm a pastor and it's crossed mine. It's crossed mine even recently, it's crossed mine. You got an idea of what he's done with the Lord. He's put this child and put his life upon this child's death into the Lord's hand. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Thank, thank God for prayer being heard. Now will they be answered? And will they will be answered? First John 5, 14 and 15, if if you know that he hears your prayer when you pray according to his will, you know he hears it, then you know you have the request. It's a matter of timing. It's a matter of God's pleasure, not yours. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room, the room where he was staying, into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said to her, Do you see your son is alive? Now this is an enormous testimony from this woman, and it shows that her faith has been removed from Baal 
to Christ. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. And you're going to find this woman, according to Jesus in Luke 4, when he discussed this woman in his home synagogue sermon, that this woman... Why did Elijah leave Israel and all the widows to go seek out this one Gentile woman during the time of crisis? The answer is because she had positive listen to her God, and God is obligated to give her gospel hearing, and when she got it, she saw it as truth and believed. And she became a testimony a testimony of the Lord among the worst of the pagan religions. In fact, the religion that she's embracing, Baalism, is what Israel is under discipline for. This drought is all because of Baal worship. And God marches into the heart of Baal worship, which is Sidon. He marches Elijah right into the heart of paganism, of Baalism, and converts a Gentile widow who was a, a witch in Baal worship. I'll, I'll show it all to you this morning. Well, we're glad to have those who are visiting with us by the internet. We're glad to have you with us today. We just introduced our text coming from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham at our 930 assembly hour, and we're glad to have you. And our study today is going to be about the mistress of the house out of our text, and who was this woman? We still don't know her by name, and yet we're going to know a lot about her. Just the title, Mistress of the House, is enormous in the Hebrew. It's not enormous in the English, apparently, but it is in the Hebrew. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our study about the mistress of this house and why Elijah passed up all the widows of Israel to speak to this one widow. Why would he do that? Oh, there's such great lessons out of this, and there's such great lessons out of crisis for your life both for the pastor as well as the, the pew. There's such great lessons, and don't miss them. Don't get caught up in the, in the, in the drought. Don't get caught up in the, in the virus. That's not what this is about. This whole thing that we're going through is not about a virus. The same thing that what they were going through then was not about a drought. It was about a relationship with God. It's not about what it is. It's about what God says it is. This is not about a virus. If you think it's about a virus, you're not paying attention to the word of God and certainly not to my Sunday studies. This was never about a drought. This was about a spiritual awakening and the drought was used to bring a spiritual awakening to a people who should have been spiritually alive and were not would have been spiritually awakened and were not. Israel was asleep at the wheel. And this woman is in the heart of a mess in her nation. And God, in his marvelous grace, reaches inside a pagan nation for one woman. One woman who is positive to God. Let's pray. Well, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type. It could be sins of the tongue or vert sins. You've got to confess that to get back to spirituality. That's the work of Christ on the cross to the Christian, to the believer. And if you want the Holy Spirit to teach you great truths tonight or today, 
uh, to your soul. You need to let the Holy Spirit teach and recall. Let him guide. Let him lead. Let him do all the things that Jesus taught in John 14, 15, and 16. That's what it's all about. You need to be able to be in a place during this crisis in our life where you pay attention to the word of the Lord. This is the repeated idea in our text. She went and did according to the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet and made Christians understand we walk by faith, we don't walk by sight. The world can't give us faith, they can give us sight. And whatever they give us by sight is not worthy to walk by. It is the word of God, Romans 10, 17, that gives us faith, and it is faith that we walk by. For God is control of everything. When will we ever learn it, Father? We are asleep at the wheel. Bring a spiritual awakening within the church of Jesus Christ, beginning with us. We need to be awake and not miss the great opportunities of testimony in the time of crisis. It is never about the crisis. It is about a spiritual awakening to the reason for the crisis. We made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last time we met, Elijah had met the widow of Zarephath and had informed her that he was the prophet of Israel sent by God to her the widow informed Elijah that she was picking up sticks. She was going to go into their, her home. She was going to fix their last meal for her and her only child at, because of the drought crisis and die. Elijah informed her that if she shared that last meal with him, she would always have food in her house as long as their drought lasted. So the widow invited Elijah to stay at her home under the principle of Eastern hospitality. And I read to you her testimony. I read to you her testimony, which is in 15 and 16. 15 and 16. And then goes on into our passage. The widow would never have her testimony without a test. See the word testimony? Circle the word test. She would never have the testimony without the test. This is true for you and I today in the midst of this crisis. This is the crisis is the test where our testimony for the Lord comes from. My, my, my. You think this thing's, you think the antidote to this crisis is a vaccine? I mean, do you really believe that? God sent this thing, buddy. If you think that a vaccine is going to solve this deal, you're wrong. This is not what it's about. Any more than the death of this child. Do you notice this child died and it wasn't a drought? He died with a full stomach, not an empty one. going on in your life is not what you think unless your head's in the Word of God. I'm amazed. I am amazed at my church with so much Bible doctrine can't see, can't see their hand in front of them. I'm amazed at that. It's kind of discouraging that we can't walk by faith. We'd rather walk by sight. You're listening to the wrong people. I'm amazed every time I hear that little logo, facts, not fear. I'll tell you what facts has produced. It's produced a great fear. You always know when the world's involved because it produces fear in the life of believers, they should have faith. I appreciate you coming today because you walk by faith. You walk by faith. You got here by faith. You didn't get here by an automobile. You didn't get here by somebody telling you, it's okay, go back to church or do it this, do it or that. Listen, you walk by faith. 
It don't matter whether you walk into a lion's den or thrown into it. It doesn't matter whether you walk into a lion's den or are thrown in it. The Lord is in charge. Can you not understand that? How many stories in the Bible do you have to read before you believe? Whether you walk into an iry furnace, fiery furnace, or get thrown into it. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord is the protector of your life, your finances, your health, everything about you. This is the story of Elijah and this woman. It's to bring a spiritual awakening. The church is asleep at the wheel. We'll never walk out of this crisis with a testimony. How tragic that'll be. What a miserable day when this whole thing is over and you get your vaccine. My, my, my. If you never get a vaccine, this is going to be your life. Empty churches. No ministry, no testimony. My, my, my. It'd be the devil who wins that round. My, my, my. My church should know better. Of all the churches in this city, my church should know better. Well, the widow, she's got testimony. You know why? Because she passed the test. You don't get testimony without passing the test. My, my. Mm. What a testimony. Notice I broke that down. What a testimony we are spiritually getting out of the COVID. What is it? Are you getting a testimony? Are you walking by faith? You don't get a testimony by walking by sight. <laughs> my, my. I went to the hospital last week. I've been to the hospital many times. I've always had ministry in the hospital. People are connected. They're connected to the patient. People connect to the patient. You get connected to them. Not anymore. Everybody lives by fear. Not anymore. I was so disgusted and appalled by the operation of a hospital today. Let me tell you, social distancing in a hospital really affects patient care. No matter how many garbs you put on, you can't beat fear. When fear controls your heart, it don't matter how many things you put on you. People would come in the room, they, it looked like Halloween. I felt like I ought to go out and get a mask. But something that, you know, would represent who I represented. My, my, my. My, my, my. What is wrong with us? This generation ought to stand up and get some testimony. We got money. We ain't got no testimony. That's for sure. Our prayer of thanksgiving. Yeah, we're praying for help. Oh, God, help, help, help. Where's our, where's our prayer of thanksgiving? You got to walk by faith to have a prayer of thanksgiving. What are you thankful for during this crisis? What are you thankful for? Are you thankful for it? I am. Do you know that not one person died by the, by the virus? Do you not know that? Not one person, not one person died by the virus. They died because their time is up with God. My, 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 church, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Where do you think the breath of life comes from? And where does it go? The Bible tells you it comes from God and returns to God. You have no power over that. I anybody who dies, you can describe something to it. But the truth is, it is God. It is God's timing. My, my, my. You forgot Ecclesiastes 3 already? Time to be born and a time to be die. 
It's called the appointed time. My, you listen to this foolishness. Don't listen to the word of God. No wonder you're a ball of nerves. My, my, my. Pay attention to these words of the widow. Pay attention to these words of the widow. She went and did according to the word of Elijah, the prophet of God teaching the truth. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah, she was positive to the word of God, to the character of God. And God was feeding her every day, just like he said he would. And then her son dies, and she goes like, ah! And Elijah has to get back in control. God has to get back in control. Listen, he's the guy who is in control of all this stuff. What we should be able to have in the midst of a crisis is a prayer of thanksgiving. A prayer of thanksgiving. Where is your prayer of thanksgiving? It's your testimony. It is your testimony how God is faithful and gracious to us and merciful in times of crisis. I'm my people. You know what people need today? They need testimony. <laughs> people need a testimony. A testimony. A testimony of the faithfulness of God. He is a gracious, mighty, powerful God. This virus didn't come on its own. No more than the drought. My, my, my. Mm. Was God faithful to do what he promised through Elijah to the widow and to Elijah? Of course. Romans 4.21, do you think God is not in charge of all this mess? Of course he is. How come that mess is in your life? This mess of the virus should not be in your life. The work of the Lord should be. Listen, Elijah is doing the work of the Lord. When he leaves... Zarephath to return to Israel, the widow will be doing it <laughs> as a missionary, a home missionary. Both Elijah and the widow had testimonies from the drought crisis. What was God looking for in Zarephath that he couldn't find in Israel? Why did he send Elijah all the way to Zarephath? to a Sidonian that he couldn't find in Israel. Do you know the answer to that? How come you're not studying it? You should be ahead of me in your studies, not behind me. What, what was God trying to get from her and Elijah spiritually? See, they're both under a crisis. God wants something different from each of them. No, you're not listening, but that's okay. I can't help that. He's got two people that he's focused on right now. He's got Elijah, and he's got a spiritual purpose. This drought is a spiritual purpose for him. And it is also, this drought is a spiritual purpose for the woman, but they're different. For Elijah, it's all about ministry of the word. For the woman, it's all about coming to faith in Christ. <laughs> oh, See, there are all kinds of need during a crisis, and are you meeting them? What are you doing during this crisis? You, you, you hold up. Uh, for what reason? Think you're not going to die in your house? <laughs> well, where do you think you're going to die? Uh, you think you can pick and choose it? Not without suicide. God frowns on that. Now, how sick would that be? What testimony was he trying to get from the Gentile woman? Well, he's got a glimpse of it. When she, she talks, she went and did according to the word of the Lord. That, that thrills the Father anytime you do anything compatible with his will. What one thing is God trying to get from all mankind? Here's a crisis. What do you think God's trying to get out of this crisis? One thing God is always trying to get out of the human race. 
Uh, God is not willing that one perish, but that all come to repentance. Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. A spiritual awakening to those who are behind the wheel and those who are under the wheel, salvation. A spiritual awakening to those who are at the driver's wheel and salvation for those who are under the wheel. <laughs> Where are we in this mess? Huh? We hold up when we ought to be out. The only person that doesn't want us to get a testimony during the drought, during the crisis or the virus, is the devil. Do you not know that? Do you not know that there's always been, already been a conference out of Luke 22, 31 for Doctrinal Studies Bible Church? The devil has already been at the throne and requested permission to sift us like we during the crisis. You need to read Luke 22, 31, 32. See what side you're on. Listen, when you get hungry, you go get something to eat, don't you? We need medicine, you go down and get something medicine, don't you? In other words, when you have a need, you go out in the virus and get the need met, right? Where's God's need? In the midst of all that, where's God's need? Where is God in all this mess in your life? Where is God? Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> I can only teach you. I can't make you believe anything. Let me give you four points today and we'll get out of here. Thank you. I didn't hear an amen. Thank you. At least you're courteous today. The widow of Zarephath held a special title from Baal worship listed in today's lesson text. She is called the mistress of the house. The word mistress in the Hebrew is Bela. B-A-A-L is the god of the Phoenicians. Baal. The A-H is a female who is a leader in it. Baal is not a female. She's a female supporting Baal worship. She's an active participant in Baal worship. That word house here would be better referred to as temple. A mistress of the temple of Baal. This is not the Hebrew word that's used for mistress with Sarah and Hagar, the mistress of the house. Gabirath is that word, and I spelled it for you in the Hebrew. This is found in Genesis 16, 8 and 9, the lady of the house. This is a completely different word in the Hebrew. It is a word that is associated with sorcery and witchcraft. Bela was used with King Saul's inquiry with the witch of Endor. She was a mistress of the house. She was the mistress of the house. 1 Samuel 28. What makes this title important is the witchcraft of necromancy. If you know anything about this deal with King Saul getting with the witch of Endor to contact Samuel who was dead. You should read that if you're interested. Because that's where our word comes from. And that's what this woman, this widow of Zarephath, this was what she did. She was the witch of Zarephath within the Sidonian religion of Baal. She could contact the dead Listen, but only with divine permission, Job 1 and 2. That was true with every witch.
Look, you got to do a little study on your own. Can't spoon feed you. If you want to know what I just said, you got to read Job 1 and 2. That she don't have that power without God's permission. She can't contact somebody that's in the Abraham's bosom without permission. My, my, my. Put two and two together and get four. She did not have the power to raise the dead. As a witch of Endor, she couldn't raise the dead, but she could contact him with divine permission. Satan, see, Satan is the promoter of all this stuff. He has to go and get permission. Then she gets permission, she can contact. Can't do it without it. And they couldn't raise the dead. Now, this is important to our study, which we're going to talk about next week. Lord took a picture. Took a picture of you, I can tell you. Well, he apparently missed somebody. He got you again. Point number two. Now, you know something about the mistress of the house, don't you? My, my, how could you miss that? I just, couldn't, make, couldn't make it clear. If it, I can't make it clear anyhow. I'm going to begin point number two with a quote that we're familiar with from Jesus that says, truly, truly, I say unto you, which means for you to pay special attention to what's going to be spoken as truth. All right? We know that. Truly, truly, I say unto you, we know what he means by that. I'm going to use that quote. The testimony given in our lesson text which is the third test for the woman and the third test for Elijah, might seem to you harder of all the tests. But the truth of the matter is, it was the easiest. Because it's going to boil down to whom will you serve? God or Baal. This whole virus thing, when it boils down, is to who you're going to serve. Baal, the world, or God? Here's God all alone today in the virus. <laughs> all alone. Here's all the world uni unified in fear. Here's God all alone in faith. My, my. The question for the widow is, which God is real? Here is the God of Israel, represented by Elijah. Here is the, the God of Baal, represented by you in witchcraft. What God is real? This test is important for both the widow and Elijah. Because when we get into chapter 18, Elijah is going to face this again. And he's going to be emboldened by what he's going to experience with the widow in Sidon. I'm just telling you, I'm giving you a heads up ahead. Listen, this, is, this third test that's coming their way is going to be no bigger than the other ones as far as God's concerned. Doesn't take any more of God's grace to do one than does the other. Do you not know that? I mean, you live like it takes more grace of God to do something in your life than the grace of God is normal to do. <laughs> Might take more spiritual capacity for grace, for grace to work in such a greater testimony way. But when God gives grace, he gives grace. He gives that 100%. Gives 100% grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself is a gift. He don't give you a gift that works from China half a week, but forever. The testimony. Listen, listen what her testimony is going to be when this whole thing. No man can serve two masters, and that's the test. You don't. Listen. I thank you. You passed the test. You're here today. 
This is a good start. If you get a spiritual awakening, then we'll have an impact in this virus time. Right now, we're the non-essentials. <laughs> you know how that irritates me every time I hear that I'm a non-essential? You know how much that irritates me? Let somebody die, I'm not. I'm the first person they call when, when they die. They die in a family. You know who they call? They call me. Well, I'm second guy. The undertaker's the first person I say. I'm, I'm right on his heels. And that's okay with me, but look. No man can serve two masters. It doesn't say three or four. It says two. For evil, he, watch the contrast. Evil either, watch the contrast now because you're in it. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's the world system. Did you know the contrast of choices in your life during this time? Look, look at the contrast. Love, hate, devote, despise, serve God or serve Baal. You could add Romans 12, 2 that would say uh, conformity of the world versus transformity in Christ. Good you? We should. This is true for us during the, this COVID-19 crisis. God matches spiritual testing to our spiritual growth capacity. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 13. I'm not going to quote it. I'm not going to read it. You should know it. If you've been one year in this church, you should know this. You should know that God's testing always meets your spiritual capacity for faith. And listen, you've proved it today. You've come out to church. Because you know it's essential. Because God's in charge of the crisis. Government's not. Do you not know by now? They don't know anything. They're flying by the seat of their pants. They're always playing catch up. You notice all the maps they show? They don't show you where you're going. They show you where you are. Like I didn't know Well, Ron, you're at church today. Well, that's good. Now, where am I going to be tomorrow? Well, I don't know about tomorrow. Well, point number three. Whatever crisis God sends our way, pay attention, is intended to bring a spiritual awakening in our personal relationship with the Lord. And boy, does it ever. I mean, make no doubt about it, Bubba. And let me tell you, having visited the hospital lately, the, there are crises in a crisis. You should see all the people that are there in a crisis that's not related at all to the virus. My wife and I were one of them. And when we walked in there and they said, you've got to have a COVID test, they stuck that thing all the way up into her brain. My wife looked at me and said, take me home. If this is the way I'm going to begin my hospital stay, I'm going home. And it took me a whole lot of convincing and praying with her to go on and get her battery changed in her heart. We weren't there because of COVID. They check, checked, and listen, I understand what they're doing. I understand that they're always a leg behind everybody else in the re reality of faith. But we weren't there because of the COVID. We were there because my wife had a heart issue. We had to get it. We had to have a battery change, which involves surgery. And when you've been under this kind of stuff for 20 years, it's not, it's not simple surgery. And sometimes you have to remind young doctors. My wife has been in this for tw over 20 years, son. What might seem like an in outpatient deal for you and a minor thing that only takes 35, 40 minutes is a major surgery for my wife who's been in it for 20 years. 
Sometimes you have to remind them. I have to tell them every time I go to the hospital, I have one wife with one life. I don't expect to lose either of them in this hospital or you're going to have hell to pay. You know, let's just know it up front. No, don't give me now that soft talk. Just go, let's go do our work and do it really well. You're dealing with an 80-year-old woman who's been under this for 20 years. Well, anyhow. We weren't there for COVID, people. And listen, there were a lot of people like us sitting in a waiting room. Well, one person at a time. It would probably been a lot smarter to send one other person in my family other than me <laughs> to the hospital with my wife. But I was the chosen one. <laughs> I'm probably not a good candidate for that because I take really serious my wife with her one life. I got one wife with one life. Now I'm going to lose any of them in the hospital for some foolishness. Well, anyhow, I'm going to lose them to the Lord. That's okay, but I, some other else is not. We're going to have a clear understanding up front. Today's lesson contains the third test for Elijah and the third test for the widow. For Elijah, he went to the brook. That was a test. Then he was sent to the widow. That was a test. The widow's son's going to die. Third test. For the widow... She was priorly, prior to Elijah, she was commanded to feed the prophet he sent to her from Israel. That happened. She was to take care of him. She took care of him. And now the death of her son. That's her third test. Now in the scale of human thinking, I suppose, there are big differences there in him. but not with God. Now listen to me. God has power over life, and God has power over death. And this lesson will teach that. Next week's lesson will certainly teach it. He has power over life. He says to her, look, you're gathering your last sticks. You're going to go in and die. Mm -mm. Elijah says, share your last meal with me, and you'll never go hungry during the drought. True to, true to the word, because God said it. True to the word. God is sovereign over life. Son's going to die, and he's going to show the widow. While she is the witch of necromancy, she can't bring her son. Well, why don't you go upstairs? Why don't you take your son and bring him back to life? I can't do it. I don't have that power. Well, I thought you were the witch. Yeah, I am. But I don't have power. I don't have power over death. Oh, well, it's a good thing God sent me your way then. Give me your child. I'll bring him back alive. And she went, what an awesome God. <laughs> Baal couldn't do that in a hundred years. All the witches of Baal could get together and they couldn't bring back one. What an awesome God. One little old prophet takes him upstairs and brings him back alive. What an awesome God. She saw something about God in death that she never saw in life that rang a bell in her career. A professional witch. And God wonderful. And God wonderful. What a testimony she had. When he left, she had testimony. She had testimony. Testimony. It is interesting how God interrupts our life in different ways to bring us into a spiritual awakening to His will. I gave you some passages well worth your time. Romans 8, 28 through 31, 1 Corinthians 7, 35. Do you know that you're the light to the world? You know Jesus said that to you? Do you not know that Jesus said you are a light to the world? Because he's the light to the world. In Christ, you are the light to the world, right? 
Are we really a light to the world? Our testimony should bear it. Our testimony should bear it. And our testimony is about the faithfulness of God. Romans 4.21. The first two tests got her attention. But it didn't draw her into a personal relationship with the one and only true God in Christ. Like John 3, 14 through 16. Put the serpent on the cross will be Christ and he will draw all men. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life and no man can come to the Father except through me. See, that's reality. That's reality. That's reality. It's a life-changing reality. It changed your life. Did it change your life? It changed mine dramatically. Now I was older. I was older by the sense of in the South, you get saved. As soon as they come out of the womb, they get saved. I was, I was an adult. What a wonderful... Listen, it's all about bringing you into a closer relationship with the Lord. Previous tests were important to bring her to a personal reality of positive volition to a God consciousness as a Gentile. First things first. She is religious, but she is spiritually lost. She doesn't realize the impact of spiritual death in time is spirit, second spiritual death in eternity. She's, that's got to be explained. She, it's got to be explained. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's Elijah's task. That's his responsibility. And he's going to do a yeoman's job. I gave you scripture. She's like Nicodemus as a Jew. She's a Gentile. She's religious but lost. Nicodemus was a Jew, religious and lost. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Which of Zephyrophat? You've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. The reason positive volition and God conscious is important is because it leads to gospel hearing. Watch the words to those who use twice. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. That's one. And to those who do not obey the gospel. In other words, if you go negative at gospel hearing, if you go negative at God consciousness, God is not obligated to give you gospel hearing. If you are positive at, gospel, at God consciousness, he's obligated to give you gospel hearing. He will bring the gospel to you or bring you to the gospel. He took Elijah and sent, her, sent the gospel through Elijah to her. That's foreign missionary work. Watch the word to those who, to those who do not know God. And the second category, to those who do not obey the gospel. In other words, once you're positive like the woman, she's positive to God, she's passed two tests. Now the third. To those who, let me close. While Elijah went to Zarephath, seeking a widow to supply his logistical grace needs, God was seeking the widow to supply her spiritual salvation grace needs. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. In all these three tests, both Elijah and the widow have experienced God proving himself faithful to his word. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Of course, Romans 4.21, what he's promised, he is always up to the task and capable of performing. And listen, they'll need every bit of that for the third test, which we'll talk about next week. Once again, Elijah will be pushed out of his comfort zone for future ministry and growth. He's going to be pushed out of his comfort zone. We have no Recollect, re, no record of Elijah ever raising anybody from the dead. Except he's going to do it in Zarephath in the heart of Baal worship 
of the Sidonians. In the home of the witch of Baal. The witch of Zarephath. Who's going to walk out of that home into that community that know her as the witch of Zarephath with the testimony that God of Israel is her personal God and Savior, is a God who is over life and death. They're both going to be pushed out of comfort zones. The, the virus is to push us out of our comfort zones, not to push us in it. Not to lock the doors and keep us in it is to push us out. Because you walk by faith, not by what? Not, not by faith, but by what? Uh, you walk by faith, not by sight. I am fearful of your relationship with the Lord that you're walking by sight and not by faith. I'm fearful of that for you. Because when you do that, you lose your testimony of God's faithfulness. His awesome power. He's the God of life and death. What, what other things could happen to you? He's over life and death. What else is there? The third thing that I've missed here? Life and death. I mean, how well are you dealing with the testing in your life? Is my question to you today. I'm asking it, I ask myself that every day. When I'm challenged to walk by sight and not by faith. I go, that's wrong. I'm not going to do that. That's wrong. Listen, it is for testimony today that praises, that prepares us for future ministry. Not only ministry now but future, future ministry, that's going to be awesome. This test is not bigger. Listen, this virus is not bigger than God. It's been sent by God for a spiritual awakening to show you that he's an awesome God of life and death. And that's all your life is about. Now, there's a lot of different kinks in life and death, but it's all about that. And he is sovereign God. He's a sovereign God over life and death. What do you have to fear but fear itself? Well, let's have a word of prayer. We get out of here. Be sure to, if you have an offering, drop it off on your way out uh, at the back, and the men will receive it back there. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for Elijah the life of Elijah. What a, an appropriate study for an appropriate time in our life. As a virus that spread across the world like it did for Elijah in his day. And how to walk boldly amidst it. To walk boldly is to walk by faith. When we walk by faith in the midst of a crisis, we have a testimony. God is sovereign over life and over death. <laughs> I know, Father. I just carry the, I carry the message. I'm reminded for myself as a pastor that it was according, according to the word of the Lord taught by Elijah. It is according to the word of the Lord as taught by Ron. That's all I can do with it, Father, is teach, encourage, challenge that the word of God may train and reprove and correct and challenge that we are the people who walk by faith in this world, not by sight. We walk in the power of the Spirit and not in the power of the flesh. We need to be vitally important people to somebody. Even if it's one widow out of our comfort zone. 
one person who needs to somebody explain to him that God is a God over death as well as life. And they are spiritually dead. Encourage our hearts today, Father, to be the light of the world. I'm afraid the light is not shining bright through the church. We are the church. We are the church. Let our little light shine. May it shine bright in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you're dismissed.